Thanks, Matthias. Um, I'm almost sad that I left your care at Hopkins. It was a lovely place, but um, yeah, so as Matthias mentioned, I recently graduated from Hopkins and I set up my lab at Vanderbilt. There's a picture of my lab with the um, Da Vinci Research Kit. It's an open source version of the Da Vinci Surgical System that's used for performing minimally invasive surgery. And uh, we started in January, we're getting gradually up to speed, but currently the goal of the lab is to build smarter surgical robots that can actively help clinicians deliver better care. And so I think it's come up a couple of times during the sessions today that right now the robots that, uh, surgical robots that we have are great in some aspects. They improve uh, the surgeon ergonomics. They have some um, evidence of improving patient care, but they can do more. And I think one of the most underutilized um, aspects of surgical robots is the lack of sort of holistic modeling as they came up earlier, but how do the different aspects of the surgery affect each other? So in a lot, um, throughout my PhD, I sort of looked at these three areas of robotic surgery separately. I wanted to model the robots, which I won't go into as much today, uh, but we did some sensorless force estimation using the signals that were already available on the robots, such as measuring the currents. These are things that are additional measurements that the surgical robot introduces that we couldn't measure before when it was humans performing the surgery. So we should have uh, ways to model them, to study them. Similarly, we can keep better track of what the surgeon is doing. And so uh, because we know exactly what the actions they have performed are, we have the we can have a recording of the entire surgery. And so what does that tell us? We saw earlier some aspects of face modeling. So um, I'll also talk a bit more about that um, and my approaches to it. And lastly, we know that the surgeons do actions on the patient, right? And so how does that affect the patient's scene anatomy? How can we model changes to the patient's scene and not only uh, model this, patients seen separately, but as a result of the surgeon actions, can we combine the models of these two? And so going into that, I'll first talk about work in modeling the surgical scene dynamics. The goal here was to figure out, can we use deep learning to make simulations better? So I started with a very simple model, this block, uh, pink block that I've cut out to make it easier to model. And I sort of interact with it through several pokings and whatever's and to capture what does it look like when I um, interact with the soft tissue model in real life. Then I made a simulation model of it and replay the whole interaction. Since I use the robot, I can exactly replay my interaction. And well, what does my simulation give me? Does that look like what I did in real life? Turns out no, unless you have really good uh, material parameters, which is not often the case, or and very good boundary conditions, which is almost never the case. Uh, but using deep learning, you can make it better. And so then uh, can we, that's one aspect of what's sort of currently missing in our ability to use a lot of um, the modeling we have built to help surgeons do surgery. The other aspect is currently the soft tissue modeling is very slow. Can we make it faster? What would it take to use machine learning to make it faster? And so uh, again, we, uh, I interacted with the soft tissue in real life. I uh, simulated this. Then I took both of these and I learned from both of these aspects in a deep learning network, a graph-based network, and used it to replace the simulator so that at each time step, instead of asking the finite element method simulation, which could be slow, and dependent on material parameters. I asked the network, hey, what is the next step? What should it look like? And it turns out that works okay. And so here's some pictures of it working. The, you can see they're obviously different right now. And so, but we can improve it with more observations. This is very uh, sort of rudimentary setup that we had and then COVID happened. So that limited our data collection ability, but it's promising that it took a, minute to compute a whole um, sort of a one minute long sequence. So we could do that at real time at 60 frames um, per second, unlike the finite element method, which took over 10 hours. And interestingly enough, both of these were similarly not correct. 
So we had the camera to observe the actual deformations in real life. And the FEM was also not correct. So people are using incorrect simulations to do stuff right now. How close do we need to actually be to affect clinical care? And so the, um, I apologize, my talk is going to be half what we've actually done before and half what I aspire to do since um, my first PhD students come in August. A lot of this is aspirational for what they will work on, but we want, um, I would like to work on making more realistic models and simulation and being able to interpret them in more realistic ways. So this is a gynecology phantom that we took a CT scan of and imported into a simulator. And in this simulation environment, we can actually collect even more data about the anatomy. So we can study the interactions between the surgeon gestures and the changes that produces in the anatomy. And the poking um, sort of actions that I've done before. But more interestingly, can we figure out what happens if we start cutting our phantom? Obviously our model then has to change. Are there sort of dynamic ways we can change the model? And why do we care about this? So more recently uh, in collaboration with clinicians, we started talking about how we can actually use models like this to improve patient care. So right now about a third of patients who get kidney stone removal surgery have to come back for another surgery within the six months because they missed something or a piece of stone got fired off and got stuck somewhere else in the kidney. So that's not great. And the surgeon suspects that this is due to uh, novices have more difficulty in visualizing the whole kidney. They take a survey, they take the endoscope to take a survey of the whole kidney and then track where all the stones are. But if you're new to this, I couldn't make any sense of the endoscope image, but can we use the pre-op CT and bring in information from the pre-op CT? Well, all the challenges are the pre-op CT doesn't look like what the patient looks like once they lay on their back and their kidneys are filled with fluid for the operation. So we need a model that will deform along with the operation as you insert the endoscope. And so then we can start a sort of build a endoscope path um, structure for motion ideas of the, um, what we've seen so far and maybe match the path that we've built to the deformed CT as a guidance system. Not a super easy uh, problem to solve. So here, kidney stones have the nice property of being very visually identifiable. The yellow thing there is the kidney stone. So great, we can find it, that's easy enough. And unfortunately, I didn't get the IRB approvals to show pictures that we captured, but this YouTube video was close enough. Um, but then the other challenges in processing endoscope images um, from the kidney stone removal is the kidney is filled with fluid. You have these air bubbles like the one there um, that on um, first glance, I thought that was another branch of the kidney, but it's not, it's just a reflection of the branch that goes down somewhere else because of the air bubble. And so, can we use all these imperfect mediums to measure uh, reconstruction from endoscope image, the CT, and occasional x-ray to sort of make sure you're where you think you are to build a map of the um, kidney as the surgeons do kidney stone removal? So that's the anatomy uh, questions that I'm currently asking. The next step is to model the surgeon actions. And so previously the work I've done on this is to take a phantom data set and learn embeddings of the gestures. And so the embeddings we chose to focus on is uh, what we can learn through an encoder decoder structure. We decided we didn't want to use any labels in um, our works, but the, uh, we fed the optical flow through this encoder structure where it passes through this bottleneck layer. And the bottleneck layer information then goes on to be decoded to reconstruct the kinematics. Not a super interesting problem. The robot captures both of these. So why do we care about the reconstruction? Well, after we train this network, we can get rid of the decoder and see what the feature representation gives us. So reminder, what we've used is the image from the robot and the kinematics for the robot. The, network hasn't seen anything that's semantically meaningful to humans. But if we plot it with dimensionality reduction, we see that it does actually cluster based on things that we think are important, like the surgeon skill level and the surgeon gestures. 
And so we can see that the, there's a cluster of expert actions in green and a cluster of novice actions in blue and intermediate sort of spans between the two. We also see that within each of the skill level clusters, there's some clustering based on gestures. That was a lot less clear, especially in the novices, but maybe novices are less precise in their actions anyway. And so by the this matter, well, one of the main metrics we're currently using to measure surgeon skill is the number of years and the number of surgeries that they have done. That's not a super great measure. I think we can um, do better quantitative measures based on their actual skill level. The problem is right now the um, surgical training simulators out there aren't great at measuring the skill beyond the threshold. They can distinguish novices from experts, but once someone becomes an expert, then what then? Uh, so one study got 10 experts to do 10 um, sort of training tasks and measure the skill on the um, training simulator and then had them rate each other on the level of skill that expert had during a real surgery. There was no correlation if you plot those two figures, which is not reassuring for using it as a measurement of expert skill. Since um, there's numerous studies that measure even after someone obtains proficiency, they still need maybe a hundred surgeries in a particular skill to actually become fluent in that particular skill. And so having something that is like this, where we know for each gesture, what level of skill it was performed at could be better for how well someone can do this particular surgery. And so some work that uh, I currently have in collaboration with Matthias is can we add to the models that we already have with additional data? So far we've used the kinematics, we've used the um, endoscope images. What if we add more sensors like eye tracking? So from the previous slide, we, uh, from the previous talk, uh, we saw that eye tracking in radiology matters. What if uh, we have eye tracking in surgery? Can we learn um, where surgeons are looking at? Maybe they think harder about this particular gesture, even though um, they can perform this gesture, they have to just put more thought into it, have less thought into monitoring things like how's the patient doing otherwise. And so it would be interesting to see what um, additional sensors we can create into our surgical robots to make them all smarter. And so lastly, I want to talk about how I want to combine these different models into a holistic um, representation of the surgery in a slightly different sense of the word holistic than earlier, but um, so far what we've seen from uh, the training curriculum of doing robotic surgery is they're somewhat very based on the laparoscopic training. They focus on dexterity. Um, are you able to manipulate this instrument in this way? But that doesn't quite capture all the um, new sort of abilities of surgical robots. And one thing that I i um, been thinking more on lately is what about the camera manipulation? Camera manipulation, it's hard to define what's a good camera manipulation since that depends on what you're doing, what's in the scene. And that's not a skill that laparoscopy has really cared about because someone else is driving the camera, the surgeon themselves are not. And so uh, we can see that in the training examples from the um, current simulator that they're just given this view. In the beginning of the exercise, they have the surgeon has to identify the anatomy and create the sutra. But in a real surgery, they're not going to be given this view, right? They have to figure out how do you get a view like this. So maybe this is part of what makes the training our learning curve for surgery so long that there's no particular training on these novel skills this robotic platform has introduced. But maybe we can develop better training techniques. And we know there's not really a good uh, measurement because people come up with these heuristics for the instrument should be in the zone of the camera view or that you should keep these specific objects in view. The problem with this is, well, the, um, we don't know what objects are important right now because image segmentation is still a work in progress. And in particular, this is dependent on what the surgeon, the phase of the surgery the surgeon is performing. So it's hard to keep track of what should be centered on the screen from the anatomy point of view. And also for the centering the images, well, I took two neighboring shots of a suturing cast from an anastomosis 
and the instruments are in very different places on the screen. So depending on what part of surgery you're currently doing, the view that you want may not be always that the instrument should be in this particular zone. So the um, image on the left, the instrument, um, the automatic camera algorithm will always keep the instrument on in the dead zone. But maybe that should depend on what the gesture the surgeon is doing and where the anatomy is. And so the aspiration for what I want to do for, I guess, the next few decades of my life is to build this holistic model of surgery where we can take in the endoscope images and we can pre-process that to extract scene information through image segmentation. We can add pre-op scans to it to understand it better. We also have a gesture embedding to understand what the surgeon is doing and what phase of surgery they're in. We have the robot kinematics. We can add additional sensors to it to make our sort of idea of what the surgeon is doing richer. And from that model, we can then read guidance for what the um, for what skill level the surgeon is at, whether there's anything off screen that the surgeon should be paying attention to, and also have a model for them to refer to throughout the surgery. And that brings me to the end of my talk, and I'm happy to take any questions now.